Uh, right, uh, thanks Paul for the introduction. So as uh, Paul said, my name is David. Uh, this uh, mess over here should be uh, pronounced Vites, so think of the word invite and then just drop the prefix. Uh, this, uh, work is based on, this talk is based on joint work with uh, Kristen, Amin, and Ali, titled The Stationary Profit Inequality. And uh, as opposed to Nick, I'm gonna give you a brief uh, recap of what the profit inequality is, and maybe give you a sense of where the word profit, where, where the uh, nomenclature comes from. Okay, so suppose you wanna sell a single item, so this uh, delicious uh, Granny Smith uh, apple here on, the, on my left. And uh, the dynamics of the market are as follows. You have a bunch of impatient buyers who arrive one after another, and when a buyer arrives, they make a take it or leave it bid for your single item. Okay, so uh, without assuming anything, you can't really get any kind of guarantee, so we're gonna assume that these uh, valuations are drawn from some known uh, set of distributions, D1 through Dn. Okay, so first buyer shows up, makes a bid, you decide, you know what, I'll wait for something better, hopefully they show up, they leave the market. Another buyer shows up, makes their bid, you turn them down, a third buyer shows up, maybe you sell them the apple, they're happy. You find out all the other bids, and unfortunately you cannot accept them because you already sold your one single item. Okay, so uh, had you known the future, if you were a prophet who knows, knows uh, the, the outcome of these uh, random coin tosses ahead of time, you would have gotten the expected max value, but unfortunately you are not such a prophetic uh, being. So instead, uh, you have to do some kind, use some kind of online policy, and the classic result of Kringle and Suchestone over uh, four decades ago asserts that there exists some online policy that will give you one half of the value that the profit gets you. Okay, so this is a profit inequality. Uh, by the way, this one half is tight. Uh, okay, so uh, switching things up a little bit, uh, six years later, Samuel Kahn showed that you can get the same guarantee, the same profit inequality, using a simpler uh, pricing-based uh, policy, posted price uh, policy. So this is what uh, Nick referred to as uh, threshold policies. So there's, they have a bunch of nice uh, properties. Among others, they're very simple. Another nice property is that they imply a number of truthful mechanisms for maximizing social welfare, for maximizing revenue, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, and uh, her work has uh, foreshadowed a rich literature on uh, posted price-based uh, uh, policies for profit inequalities. Okay, good. So there's a lot of uh, you know, great uh, success stories I could tell you about uh, over, I don't know, 15 minutes or so, but uh, instead let me tell you kind of what's missing in a lot of this uh, prior work, which is it's focusing on just selling the one item and completely ignores long-term long, uh, long horizon, long time horizon. Okay, so if instead of selling just a single uh, item, uh, you, know, you, you wanna maximize your revenue over a long time, uh, long, long, uh, time period, you'll probably keep producing more and more of these items, maybe growing more and more apples. Uh, if you want to see some other takes on this, I uh, strongly recommend session 8A on, uh, I want to say Thursday, Rod, right? So there's a bunch of talks that kind of uh, address this uh, for related problems. So back to profit inequalities. So over a long time horizon, you expect items to be replenished. You also expect items to perish. Okay, so this uh, delicious green apple, if I wait long enough, will no longer be delicious. Uh, good, so here's uh, our model to kind of address this problem. We want to maximize the seller's long-term revenue over an infinite time horizon. And now uh, the items are not given up front, but they're produced over time. Uh, and we're gonna assume that they're supplied according to a Poisson, a Poisson process with arrival rate lambda. So here's a bunch of apples uh, produced over time. They also perish at an exponential uh, rate of one. So this is the timeline for all of these apples. Uh, the buyers on the other hand also show up in random uh, time, uh, random, uh, time steps. Uh, again, according to Poisson arrivals, uh, the overall arrival rate is sum over the, the gamma i's, so uh, with rate gamma i, bidders uh, bidding, buyers bidding uh, vi will show up. So you can think about this as uh, basically there's, okay, now I hear myself very well. Uh, there's uh, sum of gamma i uh, arrival rates, and the probability that you bid bi is exactly gamma i over sum of the gamma i's. And uh, finally, they're, uh, again, uh, impatient as before, so once they, uh, once they arrive, they either sell them an item or they leave immediately. Now what I've drawn out here is the, the view that the prophet sees. The, the prophet knows exactly when everyone's gonna show up, but we're in online policy, so we don't know any of these times up front. We only know the distributions. So setup clear? Okay, a bunch of head nods, thanks a lot, okay. So our question here is how much, how well can we approximate the profit, again, using pricing-based policies? And now unlike the classic uh, profit inequality uh, setting, we're gonna have a slight variant on this notion of pricing base, so let me be a bit more precise here. So here we're gonna have a tuple of uh, value and probability. Anything above this value we accept, anything below this value we turn down, and anything that has value exactly V we're gonna accept with probability P. 
you can make this probability be either zero and one and deteriorate the bounds by like a factor of two, but we'll probably not discuss this. Okay, good. Uh, so what are uh, results? So here there's uh, two kind of benchmarks you could uh, compete with, right? So I said, can you get a high value, a high average uh, long-term uh, uh, revenue? So you can compete with the profit. So again, this uh, hindsight optimal uh, solution, the best offline policy. You can also compete with the best online policy, which is not necessarily restricted to use prices. Okay, so let me tell you what's the best prior uh, approximation ratios and what we get. So the best uh, prior approximation for competing with the profit, with the best offline policy, is due to work of uh, Colina, Imolica, uh, Leighton, Leighton Brown, Lucier, and Newman from uh, Wine 2020, who showed you can get essentially a 0.42. Well, I guess the, the, the analysis there maybe says one third, but if you, if you look a little bit more carefully, you'll get a 0.42. Uh, so what we show in this work is that you can improve this bound to one half and do so while using posted price uh, policies or uh, pricing-based policies. On the other hand, mirroring the classic lower bound of Quenkin and Suchestone, we show that one half is the best you could do. And this, is, uh, this lower bound holds for any online uh, policy, pricing-based or otherwise. Okay, uh, switching things up, now we want to compete with the best online policy, which is weaker than the, the best offline, but somehow is a more apples-to-apples -apples, uh, comparison. Um, good, so uh, the best uh, bound known here is uh, one minus one over E approximation due to Awad and Saritaj from uh, EC two years ago. And what we show in this work is that you can get the same bound, and in fact a little bit better, a 0.65, again using a pricing-based policy. Cool, so I have quite a bit of time, so I'm happy to wait, shoot you, yes? Uh, does the profit know when the app will arrive and, and expire? The profit knows everything. The, the online policy knows only when, when an apple arrives or when it uh, turns sour, that's... Other questions? Yes. Is the like, classic uh, property and quality setting a uh, special case of your model? So is the one half a um, follow? No, so this, these, these models are some, somewhat orthogonal, I'd say. Yeah. Another question. Mm -hmm. You know the item arrivals, but not the values. Sorry, so you don't know the distributions, or what, what's the setting exactly? Oh, you know the distributions, but not the instantiations of the values. Ah, I see. Uh, so, mm -hmm. um, yeah, I don't, I don't see immediately that uh, the, the ideas would carry, carry through, but I'm happy to think about it, talk about this more offline. Uh, well, I'll take, your, I'll take your question offline, I think. All right, uh, good. So before I tell you about our approach, let me maybe kind of revisit uh, the approaches implicit in, or the approaches of uh, Awad and Saritach and Colina et al. Basically what they do is follow the well-trodden path of in, you know, approximation algorithms, relax and round. Okay, so step number one, write some linear program that upper bounds the best value you could get. Step number two, round this LP in this context in an online setting while incurring a small uh, loss in your approximation guarantee, okay? Uh, unfortunately, if we want to improve on their results, there's some bottleneck we face. Uh, in particular, the linear programs that they design, you know, the best, the best any online algorithm could do for the, f versus these LPs, even in fairly simple instances, is exactly one minus one over E and exactly uh, one minus one over E minus one. Okay, so if we want to beat these bounds, we need some new ideas. And so the, you know, in particular, we need stronger LPs. And so the question is, can we come up with new constraints that upper bound any policy and, you know, help us, help us uh, sell these apples uh, more efficiently, or at least uh, provably more efficiently. And for that, to sell uh, our foodstuffs, we'll, go, we'll think about a different uh, foodstuff, uh, namely pasta. Uh, so for those of you who are familiar with the queuing theory uh, literature know what uh, the acronym I'm uh, referring to is. So uh, what uh, pasta says is that Poisson arrivals see time averages. Okay, so if you look at a long, long enough uh, time horizon, what uh, Poisson arrivals that are independent of what happened so far is gonna be exactly the long time uh, average. Good, so let's, let's derive a constraint uh, based on this uh, classic uh, queuing theoretic uh, result. So what we're gonna notice is that uh, if I look at a, a buyer at any point in time, the probability that this buyer arrives right now and observes an available item, which is obviously a prerequisite for me selling them an item, is at most one minus e to the minus lambda, where lambda is the arrival, prob uh, is the arrival rate of uh, items. Okay, and in uh, one line, the proof uh, looks as follows. The left-hand side, so the probability that a buyer sees an available item, is upper bounded by the probability that they see an unperished item that might have been sold, but you know, had I not sold anything, would have, would have been up for grabs. 
And this is precisely equal to the right-hand side by some you know, standard uh, QN theoretic analysis of the following uh, birth-death uh, process. Uh, good, so what's the constraint we get from this? If we denote by xi the rate at which items of uh, type i are sold items, this rate is at most the rate of arrival times the probability that they see an, uh, that they see an available item, which we just said is at most one minus e to the minus lambda. Okay, fairly simple constraint. Uh, let's plug this into kind of a natural uh, linear program and start working with that. Okay, so the uh, LP we have is as follows. Again, xi's you should think of as the uh, rate at which I sell to buyers of type i, so buyers who bid vi. So the left, uh, the objective is just the average uh, long-term long -term, uh, uh, gain. The first constraint says that I cannot sell items faster than the rate at which they're supplied. And the second constraint is, or family of constraints, is non-negativity of these rates plus the pasta-based constraint from the previous slide. Okay, so just kind of summarizing the discussion so far, the above LP, upper bounds, the expected, uh, the expected uh, gain of any policy, in particular of the profit, this omniscient profit. Uh, I want to say one, one extra thing about this LP, which will be useful for our pricing-based policies, which is that if we renumber these uh, indices so that the VIs are in decreasing order, then I can define PI to be some probability. If you, if you look at the top right constraint, then this is exactly uh, between zero and one. Then you'll notice that these probabilities are a bunch of ones, then some value maybe between zero and one, and then a bunch of zeros. Okay, just by a kind of local exchange arguments. You, you want to sell as much of this as possible, so you'll saturate this right constra top right constraint. And given that, you're gonna try and saturate the next one, and so on and so forth. Okay, if you follow that, great. If not, it's not, not super crucial. I mean, just the, the takeaway is important. Um, good, so here's our algorithm adapted from uh, the work of uh, Colina et al. Fairly natural and, uh, okay, so here's, here, here's how it works. Step number one, solve our linear program from the previous slide. Let x star be our optimal solution. And now forever and ever, <laughs> whenever by i arrives, you check to see if there's an available item. And if there is, you sell with probability pi, which is precisely this value from the previous slide. So x over gamma times one minus e to the minus lambda. Okay, so uh, by the observation on the previous slide, this is precisely a pricing-based policy. You know, above some threshold, I sell with probability one. Below this threshold, I sell with probability zero. And this middling, pro this middling uh, value, I'll, I'll do something in between. Okay, so uh, in uh, one quick slide, let me give you a bit of a flavor of uh, how you'd analyze such an algorithm. So uh, what I want to show you is that this algorithm is one half competitive, or at least kind of allude to a proof of. Uh, so here's a key lemma. If we denote by SI the rate at which we sell to buyers who bid value I, value VI, then the rate is at least one half times what the LP would hope I would do. Okay, so at least one half times this X value. Okay, if this is true, then, then the proof is, is a more or less a one-liner at this point. By linearity of expectation, your expected gain is uh, basically one half times the LP. And as we argued before, the LP is at least the value of, opt, of, the, of the profit. Uh, okay, so a brief uh, sketch of the, of the lemma. Again, by the pasta property, the uh, rate of uh, selling to buyers of type I is the rate at which they arrive and observe an available item and are actually sold the item. So uh, gamma I times this probability. Uh, this probability, uh, if you remember, is exactly X over gamma one minus E to the minus lambda, so uh, the gammas wash out. And then uh, what we're left with is analyzing the numerator of this expression uh, so we analyze the uh, Markov chain obtained by our algorithm, and we can show that this is greater than one half. That's about it. Um, okay, so in the next, uh, Paul, how much do I have? Two minutes? <laughs> so in the next 10 minutes or so, I'm gonna tell you, what's on? Okay, perfect, this is more than enough. So uh, I'll very briefly tell you about some extensions and variants that uh, won't, won't make it into a 15 or 16 minute uh, talk. So uh, as I said, we give uh, pricing-based policies that give a one half approximation of the profit and we show that this is uh, optimal, so one half approximation of the best offline poli policy. Uh, we show how to get a better than one minus one over your approximation of the best online policy, which is not necessarily uh, pricing based. I'll uh, point out that both of these results hold even on their limited inventory uh, space, so this is a little uh, counterintuitive. If uh, you only have uh, you know, a store where you can store, I don't know, say five apples, then you're still gonna get essentially the same bill. Okay, so even if you have to throw away items for no reason other than there's just not enough shelf space, you're still gonna get the same kind of guarantees. Uh, finally, we got some improved uh, approximation guarantees, though not pricing based, 
for the multiple multi-good setting. So now we're not only we we don't only have uh, you know apples. We have apples, strawberries, and oranges. Uh, all right. Let me maybe kind of point out some natural uh, open questions, which I think uh, you know, this this work uh, suggests. So generally, I mean, I guess for this particular work, you can ask about you know how well we can approximate the best uh, online policy using a pricing-based policy. But I think this is just true across the board. Okay. I mean. If, you, if, you, if, you're, if you're into this uh, queuing theoretic uh, stationary type of model, great. But generally, this is, I think, a, a question which is maybe not quite explored enough. Kind of competing with the optimal online policy, and in particular, uh, based on prices. Uh, next, for our particular uh, problem, you could ask about pricing-based policies for the multi-good setting. And more generally, you could ask about stationary profit uh, problems for any kinds of combinatorial uh, constraints. You know, buyers show up. I want, I want you to sell me something, maybe not just a single item. Maybe some uh, independent set in a matroid, maybe a matching, maybe uh, what have you. And uh, here again, you could ask about pricing-based uh, results in this uh, setting. And I think this would probably tie in nicely to some, uh, some of the uh, audience members' work on uh, menu complexity. So I think there's definitely some interesting connections to be drawn there. All right, and with that, uh, I think I still have time for some questions, but let me maybe pause for that. Yes, Nick. Do you have any simple insights on how the price you want to set depends on the parameters of the problem? Do I have any insights on how the price I set depends on the parameters of the problem? Uh, beyond just solving the linear program, I'm, I'm not quite sure how to parse this question. Yeah. So, you, so I guess you solve the linear program you gave, uh -huh. and then you use that exact price? Or are you and then I use exactly, exactly that price. So when you show up, so it's you know, just in the, the analysis, it's kind of like the most natural price I might use once you've told me the linear program. Yeah, essentially. There's another question in the back. Yes. Yeah, yeah, you. <laughs> so the objective you had was welfare here, right? Sure. Uh, so by just kind of Meyerson's uh, lemma type uh, tricks, you could get the same kind of guarantees for uh, revenue. Okay, yeah, good. Yes. Uh huh. Yeah, for for the analysis. Okay, so the question was, uh, are the uh, is the assumption of Poisson arrivals necessary? And uh, the short answer is yes. For this this type of analysis, if you want to rely on queuing theoretic based uh, results, then you know we're we're working with continuous time Markov chains. This is this is kind of. Uh, No, I think that's that's a very exciting uh, future directions. You know, maybe maybe think of different uh, different supply uh, point processes, etc. Somehow, um, Poisson processes are uh, somewhat more natural in the sense that they're you know the yeah. Oh, expiration time also need not be need not be exponential. That's true. I think for apples, for example, it seems unreasonable that this would be memory, memoryless, right? It's like, oh, no, 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 it's fine, it's fine, it's fine. So, pff, right? That's not the, <laughs> that's not how they're gonna work. <laughs> yes, Neil. Do you need some greedy type of pricing would work here? Because the poison arrival basically means that if buyer arrives, you make a decision, you take a snapshot at, of your time horizon at that that point. Mm -hmm. Everything starts from the beginning, right? Uh -huh. You can expect what problem you're going to face when the next buyer arrives. And you solve that problem. The next buyer arrives, you stop it, your new problem starts. Do you think that kind of policy the new might work? Because this policy of arrivals definitely helps to just I'm, I'm not sure I'm not sure I'm 100 percent with you I feel like somehow you're maybe saying something like let's solve an infinite uh, infinite space the dynamic program which a priori seems a little a little computationally hard you right? don't have to solve for the infinite future you just have to solve for the next buyer when the next buyer arrives because the next buyer arrives uh -huh. you allocate the items then the new problem starts because whatever is not perished the clock starts again but there is a state, which is the number of apples that you've got. That's essentially, that's essentially it, right? So you're, you're in some, there's some maybe high dimensional yeah, Markov chain, right? Yeah, you have, you have state. The state is basically what items you have mm -hmm. currently in your Exactly, yeah. And then depending on that, you see just one step future that what's going to happen when the next buyer, next, next buyer arrives, given 
the correct inventory and decides prices based on that. So I, I guess I guess the, the the main challenge, uh, Paul. Maybe I'll, I'll wrap up with this one. Sorry. Uh, the, the, I think the main challenge is that we don't know neither the next arrival nor the next departure. So I think that's at least greedy, like a greedy approach. I don't quite see how that uh, accounts accounts for this uncertainty about next next time event. All right. All right. Yeah. Thanks for your time. Yeah. Thanks for the questions and thanks, David.